Welcome to the Architect of Resilience podcast, where we explore the secrets of overcoming life's challenges and unlocking unstoppable strength through deep personal conversations and expert insights. Welcome to another episode of the Architect of Resilience. And this is more about you being the architect of resilience, how to build strength of body, mind, spirit in the world of chaos that we have today, to be able to use insurmountable obstacles and struggles to become a stronger version of oneself. And with that, we're having on phenomenal people that have achieved significant success in realms pushing against barriers. And don't forget to hang on till the end of the podcast where we're going to have our million dollar question for a dollar. That's right. Once uh, w- once a, uh, a week, you get the additional question for one dollar a month, as well as find the hidden Where's Waldo product hiding in the background. You can drop that on our Discord for uh, screenshots of that for a chance to win some swag from myself or those sponsors. So today we've got on George Esquivel of Esquivel Shoes. I've got his website pulled up right now, Um, but uh, really excited to have a conversation. There he is, the man himself. Uh, Phenomenal designer uh, of men's luxury shoes and boots in the world. Uh, And been a pleasure to get to know George and his work is phenomenal uh, over the last few years. Uh, He has helped us in a partnership with uh, Barefoot on some of those ends, but uh, just a tremendous, uh, you know, industry figure for what he's been able to accomplish. George, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is exciting. I'm uh, really happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. What I was hoping to dive into is some of the earlier parts of your career and how you got into like this industry and particularly like the you know the the luxury working with the stars and the stars of you know shows tv uh athletes and you know, musicians and things like that because it's not the typical path of you know someone being kind of born into that space having you know the big you know going through the the school routes and developing in a you did it in a fairly unconventional manner. I'll let you tell the story, but yeah. tell me, tell me about, you know, what was involved with that. You, you know, it's it's funny because you and I have a similar upbringing, kind of crazy, figuring it out, trying to see what it is we love, and I mean, I just kind of fell into it. So when I was, I, I grew up with a criminal father, drug addict. When I was seven, he came home shot. And he wanted my mom to patch him up when i was nine he took me to steal my first bike and then at the age of 14 i he wanted me to get in the family business and he started having me collect the drug the, the money for the drugs so i mean it was just super chaotic we lived in motels and hotels up until i was about 14 or 15 like my freshman year of high school and i just started getting fed up with it and at the age of 19 we got in a big fight kicked them out of the house i became head of the household i was the oldest of five and uh my escape at the time was uh there was a whole kind of same thing there there was in uh the grunge in seattle there was this whole punk rockabilly scene happening in orange county in la in the late 90s and that was my escape it was kind of aggressive and it was my escape to go see these concerts with my girlfriend who's now my wife and i got into the fashion back then you know based on the music that you listen to is how you dressed you can really tell are you into hip hop? Are you into punk? Are you into ska and the whole thing where, and it's just, it's part of the uniform, right? So I used to buy vintage shoes and I never quite found anything that fit me. Uh, I'm a size 10, but nine, 10, 11 at the vintage stores are always the first to go. So my girlfriend and I used to go to Baja, Rosarito and Sonata, Tijuana, you know, for the, when it was safe <laughs> and we'd go, we go down there with 10 bucks, you know, you play adult for for a day tacos on and on one of those trips I saw a sign that said bootmaker so I walked in and I said hey if I give you guys a quick sketch can you make me a pair of shoes you know because at the time everybody was wearing Doc Martens or Creepers which are back again which is kind of funny um and the Doc Martens I'd already had but the Creepers were just too much it was like a platform shoe it just wasn't for me 
So I wanted something different. So I designed this first pair of shoes. I go back maybe four or six months to Baja and I'm just like blown away. And I can't believe, you know, because growing up where I went to school, we would get bus to the nicer schools and the kids could get custom surfboards, custom skateboards, custom vans. I couldn't do any of that. We lived in motels, you know, and I always wanted these nice things, but I didn't even know how, go, how to go about getting them. So here's my first pair of shoes. And the experience of going down to Mexico wasn't very fun. I'd show up a couple of times, the shoes weren't done. So I said, you know, I got to find a different way. And this is pre-internet. This is probably like 92, 93. And I used to drive a truck from San Diego to Bakersfield, like a, like a bobtail truck. And I was uh, like a repairman for a chain of linen stores. And I would also move product in between the stores. And I started noticing all of these shoe repairs along my route. And I said to myself, if they can fix them, they must know somebody who can make them, you know, an idea. And I had no design uh, background. I just fell in love, like, for the first time. And, and, and you're just looking to do this for yourself, right? Just so that for, you can... well, for myself. Just kind yeah, of, yeah. you know, it was kind of cool. I'm wearing my shoes that I had made in Mexico, and everybody's kind of like, wow, those are really cool. What are they? It's kind of the first time in my life that I had positive I would say positive attention. You know, the the attention that we used to get was, oh, you're the son of so and so, and you know, the, my dad was just a troublemaker. Like, we had attention. I, 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 yeah, I can't day. imagine how he wouldn't be a troublemaker just starting <laughs> you. <laughs> Let's go steal a bike for your ninth birthday, yeah. and uh, need you to do my drug pickup, uh, yeah. money pickups at fourteen. Oh my gosh, <laughs> crazy. So you know, and it was just one of those things where it was always this negative attention. Of, I mean, he used to cockfight my brother and I when we were little kids against other kids and he thought it was a sport. And, you know, and it was one of those things where we were more scared of him than of a fight. And it's just this very violent lifestyle. So now I'm getting affirmation for something that I did on my own that's positive. It isn't about fighting or a tough guy or anything, right? It's just about this thing I came up with. So I'm driving up and down the coast on my route and I would stop at all the shoe repairs and this took about a year and a half finally found a guy and now i'm going to concerts and typically as everybody knows you if you're going to enough concerts you make friends with the small bands before they get big and wow what are those shoes and then the small bands go on tour with the big bands right and i had dabbled in clothing we'd made some clothes for some people but it just wasn't for me the clothing wasn't what i fell in love with and i think the shoes stuck because I always had the fakes or I had the hand-me-downs. I had the fake Reeboks, the fake Nikes, you know, and that's like the worst thing to be made fun of for having a pair of fake shoes. It's just I, the absolute worst. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I, uh, I I know that a hundred percent. And uh, I remember the, 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 the times I did get like a pair of Reeboks. I think it was maybe in middle school or something like that. Yeah. And I had those, my little toes were literally pushing out the sides. Yeah. I wore yeah. those to like, you know, there was nothing left. And, you know, Reebok wasn't the quality name then either. You no. know, it definitely was never in the the Nike or something of that nature. Yeah. I got a pair of Reeboks and I, I walk with a with a weird gait and I wear the sides of my shoe out. So I I don't know. I, a lot of guys in construction, they'll put shoe goo on their shoes. I would shoe goo them until the thing was dead. I mean, I remember playing high school football. I had the same pair of cleats from my freshman year all the way up until my senior year because we just couldn't afford new cleats and i mean there was nothing left on them but that was just i get to design my first pair of shoes so i find this gentleman in right outside of la and he was working at one of these shoe repairs and he was a retired shoemaker and he worked in uh, the steel industry here in, outside of la and he said hey come by my house i want to show you some stuff I, I i don't know why but I just I'm attracted to what you're what you want to do. And by this time, I was pretty upset because, you know, I'm paying 200 bucks in the 90s and for a pair of shoes, it wasn't quality. So I'd ask I'd get an argument, give me my money back. And this happened for about a year and a half. So I show up at his house and I remember walking in and to his house. Very nice gentleman, but he had plastic covered couches. I'm like, this is the guy who's going to make my shoes, huh? <laughs> so the nicest man in the world. But then he says, follow me out to my garage. And he opens up the shop and it's all of these machines that are under wraps. They're not tuned. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And he says, George, 
I don't know why, but I want to make you a pair of shoes. Let's see what happens. And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, let's make you a pair of shoes. And again, man, this is just like all crazy how God works and this whole thing. I wouldn't have found my career if I wasn't driving that truck and just this whole thing, right? So yeah, that's makes, a, it's a pretty wild uh, set of circumstances <laughs> at this point, for sure. Totally crazy. So he opens up his garage and it's just like this old shop. And it just so happens the mold or the last that he had fit with the aesthetic that was happening at the time. It was a very classic last wouldn't last and he makes me a pair and instantly I'm selling them to my friends. And what I would do is I would, he, I think I was selling them. The first couple runs were like 250 bucks. I would charge 125 up front and then 125 when I deliver them. And he was making the shoes at night, just kind of as a hobby. And he gets really, really busy. And then he says, Hey, I, I just can't keep up. So I said, well, keep, what, do you, what can I do to help? So I started with organizing his garage, then he started showing me the other processes of shoemaking. I never learned stitching because I was always scared. With leather, if you puncture the leather with a needle, then it's over, right? All the other things you can kind of fix and you can adjust, but I never learned the stitching. So in about two and a half years, we made 2,500 pairs of shoes. So, and this is for all the musicians in the 90s. And it just kind of, like everybody else, Chris, you 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 hang out with guys that work out in, in that profession. I hang out with designers. The musicians just started spreading the name. My first really yeah, who I, were they? Who were the like, musicians you were uh, like? The with first them? guys were were like the social distortion guys, kind of like a local punk band that got kind of big. The re the first really big name was Gwen Stefani, and no doubt we made her some hot pink bubblegum boots out of a garage. And I remember yeah, thinking that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it was super cool. You know, her, her their guitar tech was a friend of my wife's best friend. And he said, hey, they would love your shoes, made an introduction. And then we just kind of hit it off. And and I remember her saying, hey, uh, I think she said Doc Martens won't make me hot pink bubblegum boots. Will you make me a pair? I'm like, sure, I'll make you a pair of combat boots. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm thinking like and I don't even know. How am I going to get this pink leather? Chris, I didn't even know how to source leather at the time. My guy, what he was doing is he was buying just odd lots of leather, of really bad leather. And what I would do is I would put hash marks on this on the sample leather. And I would say three hash marks equals three full pairs, right? Or I can do six half pairs with this leather. And that's how I sold it. And I would have fit samples. I would literally show up at people's houses or their studios the like the Guns N' Roses guys when when Axl Rose got rid of everybody and brought on the whole new the whole band I was making their shoes 311 uh the lit there's a video of, of the band lit where Pamela Anderson eats the band and spits out my shoe so it's just kind of and it just kind of took off and and, and it was super wild it, it, really, is, that, really is wild. that video still floating around yeah I mean I think it's uh the one with if you look up lit Pamela Anderson at the end she spits out my shoe she okay. hates the band. It's like a 50 foot woman type of thing. I mean, and it's just, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And uh, we lived in this little two bedroom apartment uh, with our three kids. And I remember coming home with, after a concert, I bring everybody back at 12, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And my, my wife now is like, you know what? I can't handle this. I'm going to leave you. This is crazy. Cause I wasn't coming back to like drink and do drugs. We were coming back to like, so I can sell them shoes. That was kind of it. You know, there wasn't the internet, there wasn't where you can find anything. I was the guy who was making shoes for all of these people. And then the LA Times did a feature on me in 98, and that kind of opened up a whole new world where it exposed me to Hollywood, where we were making shoes for friends, Whose Line Is It Anyway, Drew Carey, and then movies, and it just kind of took off from there. And um, But the musicians for me have always been um like a sense of I, I i get inspired working with musicians i really really love making shoes for musicians and we've worked with so many of them killers kings of leon uh janelle monet is like a, a big fan of i'm a big fan of hers of what she does she was my muse and then we ended up having a feature for a project that i did with vogue called the cfda vogue fashion fund so they gave us a full page with that like 2009 so it, it's been a wild ride. It's been a really, really wild ride developing the business and and even working with you guys. It's been a lot of fun. I work with other companies and um, it's it's been a blast. Yeah, that's I mean, that's just such a, a crazy story. 
um, in a good way, right? Yeah, it, it is. I, I, it is, um, you know, in the beginning, it, you know, you went to school, Chris, you had some, you're, you're a smart guy. I, <laughs> I had my business on a composition notepad and I would write the names and, and I had no other idea, you know, when, when you grow up and there's not someone guiding you and I've had some amazing men in my life who've guided me, but in the business sense, I didn't get that on until later in life. You know, you're just trying to figure it out. I think the first five years was just learning about business and life and making mistakes. And, you know, a lot of people say, why'd you get into it? It was out of ignorance and love. I loved what I was doing, but it was total ignorance. And then, um, so that guy makes my shoes for two and a half years. Then I, by now I'm, I'm developing other relationships with other shoemakers that are local, but I was just kind of a hard ass on all my guys making shoes. I didn't understand what I was looking for. I had no vision in mind. I was just, they could make me nine beautiful pairs of shoes. And all I focused on was the one negative one, you know, and, it, and, it, and I think a lot of it had to do with how I, how I grew up. Right. It's just this bad upbringing. You're always, everything's bad. Everything's negative. And, you know, my idea of a perfect shoe was like the perfect white sneaker that I never had. And one day, one of my shoemakers pulls me aside. He says, look, nobody's complaining about your shoes. It's a certain aesthetic. It's beautiful the way they are. Why are you so critical of these other things? And I said, well, I want it to be like that white sneaker. And he says, you do know that that's painted, right? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I had never even thought of that. But I was searching for perfection because in my life and the way I grew up was so flawed and imperfect, like, you know, like most people's lives are where then I started developing my aesthetic of imperfectly perfect is kind of kind of what my aesthetic is for my men's and women's shoes and what we do. It's a very craft. It's a very handmade feel. You know, we don't really do super polished, uh, which I think carries very well over to the aesthetics of, your, of the boots that we're doing for you guys. And and uh, it's just rough and, and, and it's kind of real yeah. is what I believe in. Well, I got a, I got a few uh, questions based on that yeah. story I want to dive into, but first, let's watch this. <laughs> so a couple of the guys are wearing the video in. Oh yeah, uh, I see them. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, and then so she'll eat the band, and then when she eats the last guy, she spits the shoe out. When she eats him, I think she's going to spit the shoe out at the end. Let's see. So she starts eating. I mean, you know, I I, I, I ended up making her, all the shoes for all their videos. Her, her documentary was pretty good. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I I watched it. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's sad to see what people go through, right? And we yeah, we only is. see the beauty, and we see what a beautiful woman she was. But you like everything else, even like Britney Spears, the. People take advantage of you. And mm -hmm. when you're young, you just don't understand. Um, I think this is where she spits it out. There's the shoe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then we made uh, their shoes for the other videos as well. Good guys. Yeah, really, nice. really good guys. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's been a blast. We made shoes for The Rock. Um, I'm basketball players, football players. It, it's been a lot of fun. Let's dive into the world of optimizing your overall health. With pushing my physical limits, I encountered significant reductions in my health, and I reached out to Merrick Health as the premier telehealth service. I loved their personalized health coaching from the comfort of my home. They empower you with the choice of self-service diagnostic labs, or what I chose, the guided optimization with expert interpretations of blood work, health coaching, and with medications delivered to my door. Merrick Health is your partner in optimizing your health. Listeners can seize a fantastic 10% discount off their first blood work with code RESILIENCE at MerrickHealth.com. That's code RESILIENCE for 10% off. Now, I don't do athletic shoes, so it's more of their dress shoes. Yeah, they're uh, those, th those one-off, like... That, you know, that's the thing you, you work with some of those clientele, like that's the unique thing at that point. It's not necessarily the, the luxury brand so much as it's the thing that no one else could have. Cause it's, it's a one, it's a, it's a one, you know, it's a one piece thing, right? It, it's a one piece thing, but also Chris, like if, look, if we had to make a pair of shoes for you, it would be very special because 
of your philosophy and your foot splay. If you wanted a dress shoe, it would have to be, and it's the same thing with these guys. Some of them were orthotics. Some of them have broken toes. Some of their feet swell two sizes after a game and they don't want, they, you know, they want to wear that. They want a removable insole that they can wear after the game. So those are some of the things that we've developed over the years. And at the same time, it needs to not look like an orthopedic shoe is what these guys want. Yeah. I, I just also think it's interesting because we, we, literally have some of the same high level elite clients that yeah. you have for shoes that like Kabuki strength has for, you know, buying our bars, like yeah. know, the rock LeBron, like yeah. all these, like we could list off some of these names. I think that's pretty, pretty wild, honestly, at the end of the day that there's that crossover in those areas. Well, you know, I, and I, when I've spoken at jails and try to motivate the kids, and I think what you strive to do, Chris, and and what I strive to do is I just want to be the best that I can be. And I think people that can afford the best, doesn't matter if you're a landscape architect or plumber, whatever it is, you want someone who's striving to be the best. And I think your bars and your equipment and the shoes and the customer service that you give people, that's what they want. You know, they can afford anything. So they're looking for that next level of performance in anything whether it's their cars or their dry cleaner or their tail it doesn't matter and i think if we started connecting with people that we really appreciate their work whether we use their services or not we're going to find that we have a lot of the same type of people yeah. because of that what you do with your bars and i mean it's it's your passion and the same thing as footwear is my passion and design yeah and it's and it's not necessarily just a, like a luxury thing that we're talking about right i mean at the end of the day, I was really enthused when I approached you about barefoot, about yep. this idea around this function first thing to help people live a better quality of life, but actually adding a touch of fashion because yeah. honestly, so many of the things are going to make you not get laid in that market yeah. out there. Yeah, and, and, and the same thing, like we provide the absolute top tier best shoe there is for foot mechanics in the industry and i gotta i'm gonna be doing a series of videos like showing how the other purported minimalist shoes i just got a pair yesterday literally it says barefoot on the label and it's yeah. got like this massive strong like the toe area is flexible but then the, the the area that it needs to move in is just locked solid like if you're doing yeah. it it's not just like to look like a minimalist shoe like yeah you have to be able to move the foot be able to you know be able to get blood flow and yeah. build the muscles the intrinsic uh, muscles of the foot i mean it's that that simple and you know it's like funny this one had like the front of it looks like their toes but it's actually just molded uh -huh. in if you reach on the yeah. inside it's actually they're it's completely flush so it's just oh like, wow i mean, like, I mean just, that's a that's a total gimmick right it's just a gimmick and and it, it, as simple as our shoes, and I say ours, Chris, they're your shoes, they're your brand, but when I work with something, I say ours, right? And yeah. and they look very simple, but the, the development that went into it, the insole, the outsole, all of the look and the feel, I mean, what do we work on it almost a year just trying to perfect it? And then after that was perfected, then we're like, okay, let's go into an outdoor boot and slowly yeah. it's evolving, you know, the loafer and all these other uh extensions of that first shoe right yeah. and it's been a lot of fun and i and i think a lot of people just don't understand and i and i think a lot of people also don't understand when when there's someone like you and me where you want the best i want the best and we're also trying to figure out the back end of production you know like you have to make your bars and just because it's a good idea i'm already thinking well how are we going to make this because yeah. one pair is not a problem of anything right you could make one bar it doesn't matter but in order to do to scale it and make it proper so everybody gets that same experience that's where the i guess not magic but the science of things come that, in that, that's where the work comes in right yeah for sure but, but i love this you know the dichotomy of this and this is where you know my believer in this you achieve great things and you can even achieve you know balance through the extremes and you're taking yeah. me from this extreme of function and biomechanics and pairing that with you being the leading like luxury men's shoe designer and output of that is we've got this very you know affordable great product that is very different in the market than than others 
Yeah. And I, I didn't intend this, you know, to be a, uh, a marketing pitch for the shoe, but it's like, <laughs> well, I mean, they're great shoes. In the I conversation, mean, yeah. So. I mean, it's, it's, and that's kind of how we met. Right. I yeah. mean, and it's been a lot of fun and talking about what's next for the shoe and what categories you can go into. It's a lot of fun. Once people start understanding the mechanics of everything and what it is you want for your goal. And, you know, my brother, who's a construction worker, he rehabbed his knees from going barefoot, trained, you know, started walking a quarter mile, the whole thing. And I sent him a pair of boots. He's like, I love these things. And he's working construction in them, but it's the same thing. He can now where he had a football injury and messed up his leg and his knee. And once he started doing the whole walking and the barefoot shoes, he rehabbed. He goes, George, I can run a mile and a half now, two miles barefoot. And it's in a lot of, but it, it does, I don't think people understand it takes time to yeah. do something like that, right? You don't just yeah. put these on because you won't be able to, and walk, work in them uh, two hours and then because you won't be able to walk the next day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. Try to hit home with people because they think yeah. they're looking for the magic solution. I'm going to put those yeah. on and everything's going to be better. It's like, no. no, no. If you go to the gym, what's going to happen if you start doing squats? Is it going to have a positive effect? Yes. What's going to happen the day after or the two days after you do yeah. squats? It's going to suck, yeah. especially if you overdo it. Yeah. Yeah. Like It's the same exact concept of human development. Like yeah. You've got to build into it. But if you do that, yeah, your knees are going to be more protected if you're able to actually handle load, mm -hmm. handle yeah. you know the things that come at you, which is the essence of this podcast and the essence of like some of my further discussions, questions around you know, your background, uh, you got to tell me about what it was like taking that head of the household position, like that confrontation with your father, like the, you know, more of the, how did you mentally prepare for that? Or was it something that was just kind of fuming and, you know, you know, burning under the, and then there was an event that just, it happened at, and, you know, because no matter whether he's, you know, a, let's say a good person, bad person, we'll say troubled, right? Because there's yep. typically people are that way because he had his own hardships and didn't know how to deal with yeah. it, right? Yeah. But he was uh, also a bad guy. <laughs> let's just, okay, he's a bad we, guy. We, we, I, I'm not going to, I don't know, so I'm not going to say, it, it, you know, say anything <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah. But he was not I, a good my, guy. He, he's still your father. And so yeah. it's not like an easy thing to just go, this is not, you know, somebody I just yeah. met, you know? Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. So I changed my name in fifth grade because I didn't want to be associated with him anymore. So basically, people would call me Georgie. I'm actually J O R G E. He is uh, he's Salvador George, and I'm George Salvador. But I was known as a junior. And I remember in fifth grade, the cops came out and talked to us about drugs. And I was like, man, this is my dad. This guy's like a criminal. Like it's kind of crazy. And I'm thinking as he's saying. <laughs> And Your my eyes dad, are opening up. Like, my oh, eyes are wait. opening up in a sense of, you know, and I had this aha moment. And I understand why a lot of kids don't like cops when their parents are troubled, right? You All you see is the cops coming, the police showing up, taking you away, right? But that's their job. And But my eyes were open, and I'm like, wow, this guy, my dad is not a good guy. Like, crazy. I He would literally, Chris, we'd be with him, and we'd be in the car, and if somebody would give him a dirty look as he's smoking weed driving a car in the 70s and 80s, he'd tell him, pull over, get out and punch him in the face. And I and then he'd come back and like mind their own business. And I'm like, yeah, you should mind your own business. But, you know, someone sees some guy smoking weed with a bunch of kids. They're concerned. Right. Like that. Person yeah, can yeah. Die. They can they can yeah. crash. Or, I mean, they're just concerned. They're not. And for him, it was mind your own business. I can do whatever I want. So it started building. I changed my name in fifth grade. I remember being in junior high and living in a motel. So what would happen is we would move into an apartment at the beginning of the school year. Halfway through the school year, one of two things. He'd either get thrown in jail for a month uh, or disappear for a couple of weeks on his bender. Or So we'd get evicted and we'd have to move into a motel. So I'm the eldest of five, my mom and dad. And there's seven of us now living in a motel room. And this was... I, I went to 12 different schools. One of my brothers went to 15 different schools. And it was just being in junior high. I remember being embarrassed that I lived in a motel, 
being embarrassed. I couldn't have a girlfriend. You know, all the things that you can't do. I remember I couldn't play sports in junior high after school. The coach even said, I'll give you a ride home. He wanted me to go out for the football team. You know, it was flag football in junior high. And I was embarrassed for him to take me home because I didn't want him to know I lived in a motel. Knowing they already know where I live. You know, they already know where the kids live, but I just didn't want to know. And it just had been building since the age of 14. Then um, my freshman year, the end of my freshman year, he gets locked up for a couple years. He was with somebody and they killed somebody and gets locked up for a couple years. He comes out right before my senior year. And now, you know, my growing up, my mom would always say, we were his property, basically, Chris. So, like, so, and you were so you spent several years then, be you know, being that person now. When well, we now. were more of a we were more of a team, a team right? A team. We okay. were we were a team. I was still a kid, sixteen, seventeen, but you know, at at that age, I'm trying to figure out what do I want to be, what can I not be? I want to have fun in high school, but at the same time, you know, I'm back in my mind. When's this prick kid now? It's gonna suck when he gets you know, just all these things. But our life would improve when he would go away. And that's when my mom would always say to us, you know, if it's not yours, don't touch it. Have faith in God, work hard. You know, and I always said, like, why can't I just be like my dad and take it? Like, I can take anything. Like, I have no problem taking it. And when he went away that time, I realized how wise my mom was and everything. You know, growing up, I had that devil and angel on my shoulder. I could be like my dad and take it, or I could be like my mom and work for it and have faith and just work, right? So she's locked. So he's locked up and I'm a cook at a restaurant. My brother who's in junior high is a dishwasher. And my mom with my nine year old brother cleaned a restaurant six days a week. So I think seeing that and watching our life get better for almost those two and a half years was amazing. And it, and it, it, it also bred this angst and this kind of resentment, like real resentment of my father. So he gets out and he wants to be the man of the house again. And, you know, along the way, Chris, he had also turned me into kind of a jerk with my siblings because he wanted me to make sure they did nothing wrong. I mean, and that's not really an older brother's job. I mean, you know how it is, Chris. There's that tension, right? You're not my father. You're my brother. And you're right. I'm not your father. And siblings shouldn't take on the role of the disciplinarian and the father, right? It's very hard. So for many years, my siblings didn't like me. And it was because I was more scared of my dad. You know, you better watch him. So he gets out of jail and I said, okay, it's your job now. He goes, no, you're still going to watch him. And that's when I'm like, you know what? This sucks. So for the next year and a half, we get in a couple fights. And, you know, I'm I'm always 17 and he'd come home high and we're trying to figure it out what to do. So 19 comes around and I'm just, my thought is, and here's what I was thinking. I'm glad I never did it. I was getting to the point where I'm the only one working in the house. My mom's working on the weekends. He's literally doing nothing. He's just getting high and I'm tired of it. So my thought was, I'm going to wait for him to go to sleep. I'm just going to crack him with a baseball bat a couple times in the ribs and he'll leave. That's, <laughs> you know, he taught me violence. So I thought I'm just going to be violent with him. Thank God I didn't do that. Cause I would have been the one ended up in jail would have left him with with my family right my siblings yeah you now you'd be on the track for that life for him for that life right so he finds out that i'm gonna move out i'm like you know what i'm just gonna move i'm gonna leave move out with my girlfriend and he starts pushing me and then we get in a fist fight and i think he knew it was his time chris because i was just i wanted to kill him and i think he understood what was going to happen to him next the cops came the cops took him away i the cops, we told the cops that he started it, but then he started threatening to kill my mom and he would wait for me to leave. I mean, it was just super crazy. Um, the restraining orders, I had to have a friend of mine who was a police officer take away his car because he was threatening to kill my mom. It was just nutty. Um, probably until I was about, from the time of 19 to 24, it was just more chaos. But it was, you know, our lives were getting better, but he was just nothing but trouble. Just yeah. always causing trouble, scaring, coming around when my mom helped raise our kids, watched our kids. He would wait for us to drop the kids off. And yeah, just nothing but bad news. So I, I, I think just the anger and the frustration and, you know, um, 
the will to want a better life. You know, I just realized that's not what I want. You know, I, I used to think, Chris, I could be a really good drug dealer because I don't like drugs. I have all, all his friends know me. I have the great contacts. And I thought, you know, I'll just make a ton of money in a year and then get out. But thank God again that I didn't go that route. It, it wouldn't have paid off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That Thank God. Exactly. I didn't yeah. realize how many parallels that, you know, we truly yeah. have. I, oldest of five too, right? And yeah. I ended up taking custody of my siblings actually, because uh, my mom had a, a mental breakdown and left. And so they were left with my father or stepfather and it just wasn't a good situation. And so, yeah. you know, that's that was me around 21, uh, I think when I started that process. So uh, maybe 20, somewhere in there. So it was, uh, yeah, pretty pretty similar. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, it's not fun. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Um, I, you know, consequently, I, I'm super close with my siblings. It's really weird. My two youngest, it's hard. It, it's, I, it's only been the last, I would say, 10 years that I have a really good relationship with them because it was hard getting over the fact that to not see them like my kids, I had to see them like brothers. And it was very, very difficult for me. And I mean, definitely we should have all been in therapy, but we didn't. <laughs> yeah, th that has been a, you know, yeah. something that took some time too, you know, because that, that relationship with my sisters has been more like a father relationship yeah. for a long time. And now, you know, they're, you know, 40 years old, you know, like yeah. it's definitely not that anymore. Yeah. Uh, but that, that transition was uh, really interesting. Now, you clearly had, you know, some value around strength in that process like this. Yeah. You know, you're you were talking about sports, you're talking about like physically, you know, standing up to your father in this. What is the most valuable lesson? And it, and it couldn't, you know, it doesn't have to be physical strength, too, because I'm also thinking about your story of your willpower to just go into this the shoe business and like i don't know how to do this i don't know what i'm doing yeah i'm gonna make some bubblegum shoes for you yeah <laughs> and you know put, put that down we're taking an order yeah. i have no idea how i'm gonna pull that off yeah uh, you know what are some valuable lessons as it relates to strength from some of those this you know i i think with strength chris you first have to figure out the weaknesses right and I think a lot of people don't realize that. One of my one of my conversations that I have with every employee, intern, everybody around me is, if you think you can do this by yourself, you're gonna fail. And I, lear and I learned this early on, the people that supported us and loved on us, they had no problem helping if we were honest, right? Like, I don't know how to do this. And I think that's where I realized like, it's okay to be flawed. It's okay to be not perfect. It's okay to say, Hey, I remember. So I was part of this called the CFDA Vogue fashion fund. And this is where my career kind of shifted. And I really didn't know anything about fashion. And I was super honest. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. They're like, we'll help you. And I don't know how to do that. We'll help you. And then, you know, I, I didn't know how to read a P and L in the beginning, you know, like, what does that mean? You know, yeah. I, I, I had to have someone show me how to do those things. I didn't understand how to do a deck for investors, you know, all of, and I would say, Hey, can you help me? I've never done this before. And I think that is the strength. The strength comes from being first or realizing I can't do everything. Right. And, and we're not, you know, the development of my family wasn't me. It was us coming together. It was a unit. It was my mom. It was my siblings. We were all pulling our weight and, and, and trying to get ahead. And I, and I think that is where I got my strength is also being humble and realizing you just can't do it all, man. It, it, it takes, you know, this, it takes a team. It takes, you know, it takes a village. They say a village, but I, I like to say a team, you know, yeah. because once you, when you have a solid team that that's where I think I got my strength to, to develop this. And also, I, I, I also think going to 12 schools served me really well. There isn't anybody that I can't speak with. There isn't anybody that I'm starstruck about. Um, it's just, they're just humans, right? Having the, the, the worst day in my life that I can remember was every beginning of every school year where I went to a new school, you know, that was just horrible for me and you got to get over it. You got to just get over it and Hey, how's it going? And, you know, 
have wanting to make friends and all that stuff. So I think that really, really helped me uh, quite a bit. But I think that's that's where the strength is, is understanding your weaknesses. You know, that that's a big that's a big thing for me. There's something really key that you hit there, and that was around being humble, because it takes such a level of confidence and strength to actually be humble. The people that are out there beating their chest saying, I can do, I don't need any help. I'm a standalone. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can accomplish anything myself. That's, that's not real. And yeah. you're, you're, you're putting up a wall to hide your weaknesses. Yeah. You're trying to hide behind it. You're trying to create a barrier of fence to these things. And it takes strength to be humble in those, like you said, <laughs> you're working with Vogue and like, hey, I don't know this stuff. Yeah, I'm a business owner and I don't know how to read a PL. Yeah. I need help. And that's that's what's going to move you forward for sure is the ability to be humble and and step into those situations to have the confidence to be people aren't going to because the barriers the, the barriers people put up like that because they don't want to be perceived as not knowing not being yeah. strong enough and they they don't want to have that perception of those inadequacies or whatever it is. Yeah. And that's just, it's just a false reality. Yeah, for sure. You, you know, and I think once you get over that, Chris, it frees you in life, right? I had that mentality up until I was probably, you know, probably around 30, you know, even though I was, I was still struggling, like how to be humble, but also this whole fake it till you make it is, you do some of it in business, but you also have to be humble, right? You can't go around and saying if you're if you're losing money, hey, and you're driving a Mercedes or a Ferrari, right? Like all of those things, like you, they, there's so many people that want the world to think that they're amazing. And you know what? We all have amazing parts and we all have really crappy parts in our lives. And I think everybody's got their pile, but they're hurt people, in my opinion, right? They haven't figured out how to get over that it's okay if, everybody doesn't think you're amazing. You know, it's okay if you're not the greatest in the world because there is no such thing as the greatest in the world, right? There's always going to be someone who's going to take it away from you. And and I think trying to be the greatest of who you are, that's different than being the greatest in the world. And and I think it's just, you see, whether it's athletes or whoever it is, like just be boastful about that. It's like, yeah, enjoy it. You know, I don't think you're really enjoying it when you're boasting that much. And and you're talking about how amazing everything is because nothing is that amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's literally a projection of what your insecurities are. Yeah. And <laughs> your insecurities and, and the things that bring you shame. And that's yeah. the, you had a story earlier where you were talking about, I wanted to do sports. Yeah. But I didn't because the coach was gonna drive me home and see that I lived in a hotel. And that yeah. was going to be shameful for me so yeah. much that it was unbearable for me to take this opportunity to get into something that I want to do with the support to be able to accomplish it. Yeah. And and that's not an easy thing. Like you said, you were talking about that at you know 14 years old, but yeah. saying you know it took you till almost twice that age, more than twice yeah. that age before you started making those those changes yeah the changes of perfectly imperfect right because that's all of us and i think once you accept that and once you accept that we're getting older and once you accept that we're not 21 and all of those things it's okay to be that and i think that's so freeing in life um you know it, it's it's kind of funny like i used to mess around with my boy and now he's big six two you know 190 pounds and one time he told me, he goes, how does it feel, dad, that when you put me in a headlock, it doesn't even hurt anymore. <laughs> and, you know, on one sense, you're like, wow, that sucks. But on the other sense, I was so proud of that. Right. I was proud that my boy is becoming this loves to work out, loves to play sport. You know, just this. I was proud of that. And, and I think a lot of people don't understand how to do that. My dad would have never like he told me that if the day that I can beat him up, he's going to take a baseball bat and hit me with it because he thought he wanted to be the best forever. Like this weird. Why would you say that? Or the, or the dad who never lets his kid 
win at anything, you know? That's, it's just, it's silly. Those things are, they don't mean anything. Uh, relationships mean something. The humility means something. Um, if you're that boastful guy, then you end up with, I don't know, it's just, it's not a, it's not a fun thing. And it's not cool to be around. I don't care who you are. There's amazing athletes that are very humble and there's amazing athletes that are very boastful. And I would rather be around the humble guys. Yeah. You know, if you're really that confident and you're that amazing, everybody knows. You don't have to tell anybody, right? <laughs> you don't have to tell anybody of your accomplishments. Yeah. They already know. You know, it's, there's no, there's, I don't need to say anything. You don't need to say anything. Our business speaks for itself, what we do. And if it's meant for you, it's coming. If it's not meant for you, then it's not going to come. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, that, that's a funny story. Uh, how, how, how old's your son? He's 26 now. He okay. told me that at like 19. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, my son's turning 15 here in yeah. about a week. He's a freshman and he's yeah. just cracking six feet tall right now. Yeah. He started training this summer. He finally decided, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. And so I, you know, I posted some pictures <laughs> online. Yeah. And he's like towering over me. Yeah. Because you know, I'm, yeah. you know, 5'10 on a good day after yeah. I hang upside down. <laughs> I'm the same way. If I hang upside down and stretch on my hips and do the pigeon but, stretches and the whole thing, I'll get to five ten. And um, and and now you know he's lifting weights. So I'll go to the gym and I I don't yeah. do a lot of heavy lifting. And people yeah. are like, oh man, how are you going to feel? He's going to be lifting more than you. I'm like, that'd be great. Like, yeah. Oh, that's not going to hurt. Like, what does that have to do with oh, any negative I mean, feelings around me whatsoever? Like, if he doesn't bother me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's your boy. Like you want him to. I want my boy to be better than me. All of my kids be more successful, happier, stronger. Like the whole thing. You know. I yeah. mean, it's funny. I still mess around with my boy, and uh, I and I and I just mess with him. Like, and I know what to do to push his buttons. He's like, seriously, Dad, you just want to mess with me? I'm like, of course I'm messing with you. I can't do what you can do. I'm 53. You're 26. Like, that's like you're for the next eight to 10 years, you're going to be in the best shape of your life if you keep this up. I mean, I'm already on the downhill swing, right? I, I mean, I do I do a workout of pull-ups and it takes me three days to recover from that. Yeah. So, and that's what people don't. And I think a lot of people can't look in the mirror. And I think the humility is also realizing your humanity of we are humans and this is part of the process. Part of the process is you have that spike and then you're on your way down, but then you can enjoy it. You could enjoy it and you're supposed to get, you're not supposed to get enjoyment. I don't think of how amazing I am, but maybe the relationships around you, like how amazing your kids are, your boy who's working out, your two little ones. You told me about your little girl who's just like an animal and she loves and she tears it up. That's where the joy comes in. Right. And those amazing meals that your wife cooks for you. Like <laughs> that's, a that's, that's the joys. You got to start yeah, finding yeah. joys in different things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, some more recent struggles and things. Yeah. I know, I guess I, this wouldn't be terribly recent, but I know that you've struggled with some back pains from, a yeah. an incident, you know, 13, it, 15 years it ago. Was in, and, in, it was like 18 years ago, Chris. And that, you know, I'm so bummed because I wanted to go after you stretched me out when we came up and you worked me out, my back felt so good. And then I was going to take my son up to one of your seminars and I had, a, I was out of town for a job and it's one of those things you just constantly live with. Right. And it hurts and I'm constantly stretching and it, it actually affects my exercising because in order, and you talked about this, like, Hey, if I'm going to squat, I still got to go do these stretches for 15, 20 minutes beforehand. And it kind of takes the fun out of it sometimes because you, you remember the days where like, Oh, okay, I can't warm up for five minutes and I hit it and then you're good. Now it's, 20 minutes of pre and maybe 15 minutes of post and you're like well i did 30 minutes of stretching and only like 30 minutes of working out because that's all i had time for but it is the chronic pain and and i also think a lot of it has to do with the stresses of life and business business is very stressful as you know the ups mm -hmm. and downs uh salaries all of those things that come into play and orders and cancellations and how are you going to make what you just received and I think that ends up being part of the stresses of my back. And, you know, I love mountain biking, but I can't do it as often because my back, if it's sore, I can't go because I won't be able to walk the next day. 
I mean, you and I can't take a day off, Chris. We have our own businesses. It's not like you can call in sick, right? Yeah. That 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 is such a uh, that's such a misnomer for people that yeah. don't own businesses. They think, yeah. oh, you, I want to go into business like you, so I can set my own schedule. I'm like, ah, yes, so you can set your own schedule. What <laughs> involves working all the time seven <laughs> days a week <laughs> seven days a week like, i mean it and, never ends. you can pick whichever of the seven yeah. days that you want yeah, yeah. <laughs> week. You, it's, it's <laughs> non-stop <laughs> and oh it's got to be easy and it's like it is uh, so not cut out for for most people it's about yeah. to be this is you know the story of how you got here and the story of what i do should be the valuable lessons and this is what i try to preach to people is like don't be going into business to try to make money because it's going to be yeah. a long hard haul that's going to be painful and and even if you are successful it's not going to happen quickly and it's going to be so much work that you know at the end of the day it probably would be easier just working for someone else so yeah. you really need to understand your values like who you are as a person and you know how you want to present and what you want to do in the world and i think that is something that you very clearly articulated with how passionate you are how you you know the stars did align and created this path for you but it was just they they aligned because it was it was meant to be it was your calling yeah. and and so you know that is an important lesson for people and it's not like i i, I don't want to present the the hustle porn, the grind, the whatever. If you just grind, 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 you'll get there. Uh, that certainly doesn't always mean the case. Like there's <laughs> there's years you will kick your, you will grind your butt off and it just won't work because it, there's it, so it much that's work. outside of your control. Yeah. And yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's where these values of strength, like your background rolls into how you have had this continued success because you know you've been at this for quite some time most businesses don't last you know beyond five years how long yeah. have you been doing esquivel shoes now we we've been making them in-house for 21 years with years of amazing years of way less than amazing where you're like oh my gosh and you know and talking to business owners like you chris you realize that this is the struggle I, I asked myself, maybe I would do it differently and maybe I'd be a graphic artist. And I sat in front of a computer a couple months ago for six hours and I said, I hate this. I, yeah. I don't care how much you pay me. There's no way I could sit in front of a computer. I think it's cool to do graphics, but to do that as a job, I would be miserable. I love what I do. I love traveling. I love meeting people. I love just when you guys came down to the shop that we recently left in Los Angeles um, that was my, one. That, that's what I love doing. I love talking to people. I love understanding who you are because that helps me develop the product, right? The, the customer service aspect of it. I, Chris, I get to live other people's lives by understanding them, seeing your shop, seeing your truck, seeing all these things. I'm like, this is the coolest thing, you know? And I get to experience a little bit of that. I, I've, I'll probably never build a house like your amazing house. I'll never build a truck but I appreciate all those things. And, you know, when I used to go up and, and fit the founders of Google, I'd go up and meet with them and talk to them. And that was like the coolest thing. Or I used to go to Nicholas Cage's house and talk to his British butler and, you know, just, and see his car collection. And he talked to me about his cars, cars. I will never have those cars. And I understand that, but it was just amazing experiencing that. And I think those are some of the good things that I take with a bad, right? Because, yeah. You and I have to take the bad and all business owners, you got to take the bad. I know so many people that they're on their third businesses and everybody thinks, oh, it's been amazing. I mean, I've had to shut down businesses before. I've, I've had to shut down two other businesses because I thought they could be ancillary businesses to what I'm doing. And it's like, this requires so much love and attention. And it wasn't that it failed. It's like, I didn't even really know what I was doing, but it's okay, right? It was part That's of the learning that's the thing it's okay to do yeah. it and to fail like <laughs> yeah that is the message because you're going to learn in the process you're going to better understand yourself out of that you better understood where you wanted to put your time because yeah, yeah you're working sure. seven days a week but your work is your life your love your passion you wouldn't yeah. be doing anything else exactly and this is 
being afraid of like, I have to have the perfect plan. No, I'm going to take out my, my notebook and start taking uh, orders for pink bubblegum boots. Yeah. And we're going to go yeah. figure this the freak out. I, I don't know how to gotta f- I don't know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. It's crazy. <laughs> you, you know, and I think a lot of kids, I'm hoping kids are listening to this because the the whole, as you, you have kids, Chris, my kids, my youngest is 22, but they're still dealing with the influences of social media where they don't realize that they don't have to have the same career forever. You know, like my my youngest wants to be a nurse and, you know, they're struggling. Like, is this really what I want? I said, so what if it's not what you want? Change. You're able to change. You're able to have a career at the age of 35, something different. Go after it. Chase your dreams. I think everybody should chase their dreams. And I think everybody should try to have a business. You'll appreciate life a little bit more of how hard it is. But I also think, as you said, it's okay to to change and it's okay to fail. It's okay. That's that's what life is there. Um, I don't believe in protecting my kids that much. I want them to fail, but I want them also to say, hey, can I get some advice? Because I think there's a lot we can learn. If somebody says, hey, Chris, I want to manufacture. Can I get some advice? You're like, sure. Let me tell you how it is. Let me tell you. It's basically it's like uh, breaking up glass and taking a cup full of that some days. Right. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I mean, it's difficult. Yeah. That's what I've loved about this, you know, discussion we've had so far is the, you know, that just, it's okay to not know what you're doing. It's okay to step into the unknown. It's okay to fail because in this process, you're still learning and growing. Yeah. And, and, and there's no set hard path. You don't have to have like, I'm coming out of school. I got to pick the career and go to school for the thing that I'm going to do for life. And I'm stressing over like, is it this or this? Like, pick one and go yeah pick one and go and guess what you may change direction later i've got two degrees in engineering and yeah. a master's in business and you know like was a completely freaking different career until yeah. 2015 i said yeah i'm gonna just go over here <laughs> and i went <laughs> yeah. and you went you're and it's and it's working for you right it's working and and and, you and i might do, and i might do the same again you know yeah like <laughs> that that's kind of what life is about i mean i you the people that i admire it has nothing to do with celebrities it's you look at the person wow they learned they went and got their degree at 50 or they decided to become a lawyer at 45 or they ended up learning how to speak four languages those are the things that inspire me like it's not about I'm 53. I'm in 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 the business world. I'm eight to ten years from retiring. Like I have no intention of retiring. Someone asked me how long you want to do it. I'm like every day till I die. Maybe not to the same level of seven days a week, but I love people. I want to give back. I mean, mentoring people. There's there's just I think I don't I don't understand the people. I'm just going to retire and play golf five days a week. It's just not and not not that there's anything wrong with it. If that's what you want to do. Great, but that's just not how I'm built. Uh, and I don't think entrepreneurs are built that way. Yeah. yeah. If you want to grow in life, I suggest that you do what George has done if you think about early in his career, okay? And that is given the opportunity, that period of time of George jumping in and learning, he probably learned amassed 10 years of experience in that first year. Yet I see so many people take 10 years of repetitive mundane work in life and not even gain a year of experience in 10 years worth of work flip things on its head and gain and garner as much as you can and that involves being in the unknown it involves failing it involves being introspective it involves being humble it involves all the things that we talked about in this podcast and that is how you can propel yourself decades above everybody else around you. Yeah, for sure. I, I think it's so easy, Chris, they, there was no internet when we were around growing up right now, you can literally have a side hustle and understand business buying and selling online. It's, it's, I wish I didn't have to drive a truck up and down California to find a shoemaker. Now you just Google everybody. You can learn how to do everything. You can learn a second language. You can understand and apply those things and and i i suggest to everybody like you it's like go out and learn and go out and fail it's just time you know spend a little money and effort and make it happen i had someone the other day and they asked me so how much does it take 
they wanted to develop some leather goods. And I said, have you done any research? And they're like, no. I'm like, so why are you even talking to me? Like, you need to go do some research. Like, it's all online. I, I said, if you really want to know, you will come prepared. And you'll say, hey, George. And I said, you went to college, right? And he goes, yeah. I said, didn't he teach you to research? He goes, yeah. So like, go do your research. Don't just come to me because that's like the shortcut, right? Go figure it out. If you want to make bags, say, hey, I studied all these videos. I can't figure this out. Then come to me. But a lot of times people want the fastest route is what back to your point. Go fail. Go figure it out. Go. If you want to make shoes, go cut your fingers a couple times. You know, yeah. those are the things that you need to do. If if you want to learn from an expert, like you would do that, do your homework, come prepared with intelligent yeah. and thoughtful things and talk about what you've what you've what you don't understand or what your what your ideas or theories on based on the yeah. research and also be prepared to try to figure out some way to add some value to that expert in the process because i guarantee you probably get so many emails and messages of people through the years going man i'd give so much to have copy coffee with you and pick have the chance to pick yeah. your brain well so would thousand other people yeah right? for sure what is that you know, like let's let's make something of value on both ends. Do your homework, but also figure out some way that you can that you can provide some value on the other side of it as well. Yeah. I mean, that is the opportunity because so much our whole educational system is broken compared with the opportunity, the vast opportunity that we have to live and learn in today's age. Uh, there's yeah. so much resources at your disposal that you don't have to sit there driving. I, up and down, uh, was it I five or one hundred and one yeah. or wherever? It was the uh, it was the five from San Diego to Bakersfield, looking for that. You know, I, I speaking to the point. I, I really think our system is broken. You know, I've tried to bring on uh, apprentice, but there is no true apprenticeship program in the United States. If you go to somewhere like Germany, you know that you're going to go through the apprenticeship program. There is no quitting and re getting unemployment, right? Here, if they quit or they'll they'll do some, I I stopped taking apprentice because it's we slow down to bring them on, and then they realize how hard it is. I mean, making shoes, the guys that are pulling the leather, it's you're basically like swinging a hammer all day, and if you don't, if you're not really ready to swing a hammer all day, and if you're not ready to be corrected, like that stitch is wrong, that stitch is wrong, that stitch is wrong, no, it's wrong. Like in construction, right? You're just telling me what I'm doing right. Can you, <laughs> wrong. Can you tell me something that I'm doing right? You're hurting my <laughs> yeah, feelings. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I have friends that have I, done. I, I, I know other people that are doing dealing the same thing with apprentices yeah. right now. Yeah. And so we don't take on, we really don't take on apprentices anymore because there's not a system. They'll, we've had some issues where we've had to put them on, you know, I, they quit or they'll do something. We have to let them go. And then they're on unemployment. And it's like, well, that was a waste of time not you, you know it's it's a different mentality here of our school system we're not taught i don't think the kids are taught anymore to stick with something and see it through whether it's a year or a year and a half right you got to see it through and to see if you really like it i tell my kids all the time take a class read a book if you get one thing out of it it doesn't matter if it took you six months it's something that you can add to your your list of what to do or what not to do in life right it's yeah. not all about like oh my gosh i'm a genius now because you're not there's very few geniuses are born, right? It's you got to work at it yeah. and you got to nurture those things that the, the, the geniuses it's they're there, but it, you still have to nurture it. Yeah. You know? So I, I, I'm with you, man. It's a, uh, it, it's a tough road. It's a tough road, but I, I, I always think like, what else would I do? I, I think if I could do it again, I'd probably do the exact same thing, but if I had to choose something else, probably be a firefighter, you know? Get paid to work out, stay in shape, <laughs> have a cool job, be uh, physical. That would be a fun job, but it, that would be a great job. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be a fun job. Uh, be, being a firefighter, and you know, it, I. But I always then I think back. Well, you only work ten days a month. I could have a side hustle because my thinking is, <laughs> what's the side hustle that I would have? Right? Uh, like uh, I'm never. That's like, why you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I was before I had my business, I would. Uh, I'd go around and buy old lawnmowers and fix them up and have yard sales and just whatever it took. And I think that's what I got from my dad was the hustle. He was just a con man selling things, right? Yeah. Always selling, always selling. Uh, and I and I ended up, you know, 
it's not like I'm trying to sell people, but I don't have a problem telling you what it is. And if I believe in it, I have no problem selling, you know, and talking about it and how great the product is. Yeah. Cause that's really all I, I don't really want to be involved with products that I don't believe in. Yeah. And, um, and that's a big mistake. I think first for a lot of people is, as you said, they go after the money first and, and sometimes you have to take the money, but I'm not really about the money first. And at this stage, when I was younger, yes, but now it's like, you know, is, am I going to be happy doing it? <laughs> not really. So why do it? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I want to, uh, thank you for your time today. Yeah. Uh, wish we had some time to talk about the amazing Brune boot, by the way. But uh, <laughs> for anybody that, uh, if you're not familiar with it, check it out. Uh, our million dollar question uh, if you sign up for a, a dollar a month, you'll have access to, to that. But uh, we're going to ask George uh, that here in a, in a minute. But thank you to all our guests. Thanks for having me. All right. Yeah. So now I've got another question for you, just really quick. Yeah. Um, What is the most valuable lesson that you have learned or the singular trait that has helped you be successful as a, as a businessman in the fashion of being able to particularly make a mark on an industry, not just be in that industry in a successful business, but being, you know, putting your name out there? The, the, the number one thing. Well, wow, that's a tough one, Chris, because there's like four or five. Okay, you can I mean, off however you no, want to I mean, approach, I mean, approach I, this however you yeah. want to approach it. Well, I think the number one is is uh, be honest and be humble, right? Like you got to be honest with who you are and you got to be humble. That will open up doors, in my opinion. And I and if you really want to like just one word is no is not an option. You know, that's that's like the powerful one. No is not an option. And I think you exemplify that, like, I don't care what anybody says, I'm still going to do it. It doesn't matter. And I've had that kind of, like, there was an article that was written about me that good luck uh, trying to figure out how to make shoes in California, because there is no supporting cast of industries in the U.S. for shoemaking and leather goods. There is, but not not like in Italy or Spain or Brazil or Mexico. You have all of the other industries support the shoemakers, and it doesn't happen here. And I was like, I don't care. I'm I'm going to figure it out. It can't be that hard, you know? <laughs> so I think those two, I mean, no is not an option. And, and the other one would probably be is, you know, just uh, stay humble and, uh, and be honest. Yeah. 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 Take that as a challenge when people say you can't do something. So yeah, for sure. Or, yeah. You know, that's how I got involved in the shoe market was I was working <laughs> with the minimalist shoe company yeah. to take on uh, US based education and they just started ghost me and like, I'm like, how am I going to move forward with this? Well, guess we're just going to start our own brand. <laughs> yeah, there it is. That's it. And then, and yeah. here you are, right? You guys are, like, are doing great. Shoes are amazing. People love them. I mean, it's, 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 I told, I told uh, your partners, it's like, you really ought to be proud of yourselves. It's not the shoe business. And I think a little bit, Chris, if you think about it, it's the, it's the passion and the ignorance, the same thing I had, right? And ignorance is not a bad word. You know, a lot of people think yeah. ignorance is, a, it's not a bad word. It's just not knowing. Right. Uh, but the passion and the ignorance, the guys are like, Hey, we're all in you. We're all just going to do this and it's working. And I'm like, guys, this doesn't happen in the shoe industry. <laughs> this doesn't happen. And they're like, uh, really? I'm like, yeah, it doesn't happen. I mean, it takes years yeah. to get, you know, but I also think all of you combined, you're not kids. You're thinking about it properly. You're going about it. You've already had your own businesses. You've had some failings. You've had some successes. So you combine that with what you want. And now you're like, oh, you're, you're, you're not on, you're not on level one. You know, you guys are like a six or a seven out of 10. So you're, the, you're there, right? It's, yeah. it's a much different process. Yeah. Yep. We've had that stepping into the unknown and and uh, yeah. learning in the process. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, George, absolutely tremendous. Uh, we got to catch up again. Uh, ourselves yeah, for sure. Sometime, but that this yeah. was a really engaging conversation. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right.